In my previous video, I said that I wanted to make my own integrated circuits, and I built this tube furnace to help me do that. Now, I'm going to figure out how to use this furnace to create oxide layers on a silicon wafer. But, hold on, I'm jumping the gun a little bit here. First, what is an oxide layer, and why is it needed for making integrated circuits? This is a discrete op-amp circuit for sensitive instrumentation, and this is a similar circuit entirely contained within a single silicon chip. Both accomplish similar tasks, but the one on the right is far cheaper. Well, obviously it's less expensive, you say. The integrated circuit on the right is smaller and requires less material. Well, that's not really the whole truth. Smaller doesn't always mean cheaper. Researchers in the late 1950s successfully miniaturized existing circuit board technology and created the hybrid integrated circuit. The resulting devices were far smaller, but they weren't any cheaper than existing boards. Any cost savings from using less material was offset by the difficulty of manufacturing on such a small scale. So why was the hybrid integrated circuit the first attempt at miniaturization? Surely someone considered putting all of this on one chip, right? Well, a surprisingly difficult obstacle to overcome when building a circuit on a single chip is, how do you wire the components together? No one could figure out an inexpensive way to create interconnections between two devices on the same chip. Semiconductors aren't insulators, so any metal wires on their surface would need their own insulation to prevent short circuits. This really wasn't feasible at the time, so the idea of a true integrated circuit wasn't seriously considered. That all changed, though, in 1955, when Carl Frosch and Lincoln Derrick, two researchers at Bell Labs, discovered a method to convert a thin layer of silicon on the surface of a chip to silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is a very pure form of glass, and it is an excellent insulator. This was the missing piece of the puzzle. Now, you could grow an insulating layer of silicon dioxide directly on the surface of the chip. Metal wires could be added on top, and they would be insulated from the silicon substrate below. Holes in the oxide layer would be used to define exactly where the wires made connections to the silicon devices, which meant that, for the first time, researchers could put multiple interconnected devices on the same chip. Not only that, but the process for growing the oxide layer was very simple and doesn't require any additional materials. Because of that, it greatly reduced the complexity required to produce an integrated circuit. This breakthrough finally allowed for the production of true integrated circuits, and it's probably the single biggest reason why silicon dominates the industry today. So we've laid out the facts in history, but how do we actually achieve any of this in the home lab? Well, we have two different ways of growing oxide layers, the dry method and the wet method. The dry method uses oxygen from the air and reacts with silicon at high temperatures to form SiO2, or silicon dioxide. This method produces the best quality oxide layer, but has the disadvantage of being extremely slow, so it's really only suitable for very thin layers. The wet method, on the other hand, uses steam. The oxygen in the water molecules is the source of the oxygen for this reaction. The reaction also takes place at high temperatures, but it is much, much faster. For any given temperature, the wet oxidation method is around 10 times faster than the dry method. Because of that, we usually use wet oxidation for any layers greater than about 100 nanometers. We are looking to make thick oxide layers today, so this is the method we will use. I'm using the tube furnace I built in the last video to do this oxidation. The furnace is set to 1000 degrees Celsius. We need a source of steam, which is going to be from this Erlenmeyer flask. I filled it with a couple hundred milliliters of water, which should be enough for a couple hours at least. I'm setting the hot plate to medium, which is a gentle simmer. I've added a stopper and a right angle glass tube to redirect the steam so that it can be fed into the tube furnace. Now we need some silicon. I got these wafers from an auction on eBay for dirt cheap, but you can also buy wafers new from lab suppliers and even Amazon if you want. These wafers are actually not pure silicon. They are already doped with an extremely small amount of boron, but that won't affect the oxidation process at all. Now, these wafers are obviously not going to fit in our tiny furnace. We're going to need some way of cutting the wafer up into manageable pieces. Fortunately, all we need to accomplish that task is this tool. It's called a scribe, and it's essentially just a pen with a really hard, sharp point. The tip on this is tungsten carbide, and this one is diamond. The really cool thing about silicon wafers is that they are basically a perfect crystal all the way across, which means that all you need to do is just scratch the very edge of the wafer, flip it over, press on the scratch, and the wafer cracks perfectly down the line, 
I never get tired of that. The separation is basically dead straight, and if you score it in the other direction it will form a perfect 90 degree angle every time. It's the little things like this that make me smile. It's always important to clean the surface of a silicon wafer before using it. In this case we're just doing an oxide growth, so soap and water will be fine. In most processes like these, a manual cleaning is done first, and then it's followed up by a cleaning with aggressive acids like Piranha Etch. That's not really necessary today though. One thing that is important though, is you should always use distilled water for the last rinse step, and then blow dry it with clean air. That should minimize the amount of dust and other contaminants left on the surface of the wafer. I chose to make a whole bunch of really small chips. Each one's about 5mm by 5mm, and you'll see why in a minute. For upcoming projects, it's not going to be enough to just create an oxide layer. We need to be able to grow an oxide layer with a known thickness, and we need to be able to do it consistently. The first step towards that goal is to find a way to measure the thickness of the oxide layers we create. Our goal is to create oxide layers with thicknesses in the hundreds of nanometers, far thinner than a human hair. Measuring such a tiny thickness might at first seem like an impossible task. A regular microscope can't even see things that small. Fortunately, there is an easy way to measure the thickness without a microscope. If you take a silicon wafer with an oxide layer and shine a light on it, some of the light will reflect off the surface of the oxide, and some of the light will go through the oxide layer and reflect off the silicon surface. The light that is reflected off the silicon surface took a longer path than the light that was reflected off the oxide surface, which means that the two light sources are no longer in phase. This causes the two reflected light sources to interfere. Since white light contains multiple wavelengths, some of the reflected light, blue in this case, will interfere destructively and become more dim. At the same time, other colors will have their light reflect back in phase and interfere constructively, which makes them brighter. Because white light contains all wavelengths, these effects combine, and the white light reflects back as a different color entirely. The exact color you see will depend on the thickness of the oxide layer. Now, it can be a little difficult to view the color of an oxide layer. You'll need a good light source, something with a continuous spectrum, or high CRI. Fluorescent lights and low-quality LEDs generally don't work well. You can use incandescents if you have them, or even just sunlight. I'm using an LED panel with a high CRI, specifically made for photography. I have mine on a tripod so I can adjust the angle to my liking. I set mine up so that the oxide is viewable when the chip is lying flat on the desk. I wanted to grow a bunch of different oxide thicknesses at once, so I put a bunch of tiny chips into my quartz boat and put them into the furnace at 1000 degrees C. It's important to get them directly in the center so that the temperature is accurate. I make sure the steam generator is working, and I insert the output tube into the furnace. Every five minutes, I take out one of the chips. I keep this up until I have a spectrum of thicknesses corresponding to growth times from 0 minutes all the way up to 150 minutes. Side note, 150 minutes is kind of a lie because I had to take the wafers out each time, which means that part of that 5 minute interval was spent heating the wafers back up to temperature, but don't worry about that for now. What's relevant here is the spectrum of the colors we get. You can see that the surface starts out silver, which is the color of the silicon. Then after a while you can see it turn purple, blue, green, yellow, then back to purple, blue, green, yellow, and the pattern repeats. This is a chart showing the colors that we can expect to see from thin layers of silicon dioxide on silicon wafers. As you can see, the colors on the chart match pretty well with our experimental results. The only thing that is a little bit off is that our spectrum seems to stretch out over time. You can see in the top row that the colors cycle relatively quickly, but by the time we get to the bottom, it takes 20 or 30 minutes for the colors to change. Why is that? Well, the reason for this is simple. The reaction that creates the silicon dioxide is happening at the silicon surface, which is initially exposed, but slowly is being buried beneath an oxide layer. In order to create more oxide, new oxygen has to penetrate the entire thickness of this existing oxide layer, and then react with the silicon to form silicon dioxide. The thicker the oxide layer, the less oxygen reaches the surface, and the slower the layer will grow. Armed with this knowledge, we can use this chart to estimate the thickness of our various oxide layers. I went ahead and labeled all of the chips with my best guess from the chart. If we're careful, we can expect our estimates to be maybe 25 nanometers away from the actual value, which I would say is a pretty good accuracy given that we're measuring nanometers with our eyes. Also, for the kind of stuff we're hoping to create, plus or minus 25 nanometers should be decent. Now this chart is good, but 
we have a bit of a problem. If I want to know what color 320 nanometers is, well, no problem. Just find it in the chart. But what if I go in the opposite direction? If I have a purple chip and I go to the chart, well, it might be 280 nanometers, but it could very well be 110, or possibly 480. If we want to be able to use this chart to pinpoint our exact thickness, then we need to somehow already know its thickness within a window of about 100 to 150 nanometers or so. Good news! You can estimate the oxide thickness using this easy-to-memorize formula. Oh, and you'll need these two as well. Wait, where are you going? Come back! Come on, I wouldn't do that to you. There are a bunch of online calculators for thermal oxide growth. Here's the first Google result. We just have to enter our desired thickness of 380 nanometers, our temperature, 1000 Celsius, what kind of wafer we have, and whether we're running a wet or dry oxide growth. And there. Looks like it'll take us 58 minutes. There's only one real caveat here. The growth rate is pretty sensitive to the temperature of the furnace, as well as the amount of moisture in the air. It's possible that even if you run these numbers in real life, you'll be off by a fair amount. The best approach to getting the oxide thickness correct is to use the formula and then verify the results with the chart. That should maximize the chances of success. Now, the golden rule for semiconductor fabrication is repeatability above all else. Fabricating a device can take many steps, and small errors add up. For that reason, it's important to have a good grasp of how consistent your equipment and processes can be. I noticed when I was first running these tests that my oxide layers were nowhere close to the values the formula specified. I'd put my wafer in at 1000 degrees Celsius for an hour, and I'd expect to get 380 nanometers, yellow, but the wafer would come out bright blue or purple instead. I was expecting to get results like this, but what I actually got were results like this. So what's the problem? Well, the first thing to check is that your temperature is correct. Now, unless you have a bad thermocouple, the most likely issue is that your furnace temperature isn't very even. It's pretty much a guarantee that the temperature will fall off as you move away from the center. If you want to estimate this for yourself, get a piece of silicon that is about 10 centimeters long and carefully insert it into the furnace so that the edge of the wafer is directly in the center. The oxide growth rate will be fastest here, and it'll be slower as you move toward the other end of the wafer where the temperature is lower. You can clearly see the temperature gradient on the wafer as I pull it out of the furnace. I ran this test for 30 minutes at both 1000 degrees and 1100 degrees Celsius. This is the result. You can see how the color changes pretty quickly as the temperature falls off. You can use these results to calculate the temperature gradient of your furnace. I start by using the chart to determine the thickness of the oxide at several points. Then I use the calculator to determine what the temperature was at the corresponding locations. It looks like the drop-off is about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius per centimeter. That isn't horrible, but in the future I'm going to plug the ends of the tube, and I'll probably also make the tube longer to mitigate this problem. I'm also going to use pieces of silicon that are much smaller than this, so the uneven temperature should be less of a concern then. In larger tube furnaces, you can load the wafer in vertically, which mitigates this problem somewhat. I did have to track down one more issue with the furnace, and this one took me a while to notice. I had already accounted for the temperature gradient, and was making sure all of my chips were placed directly in the center, but I was still seeing problems. Most of my oxide layers were coming in below the expected values, and worse still, the exact amount of that difference was inconsistent. The variables in the formula for wet oxide growth are temperature and time, so I was a little confused what was going on. Well, as it turns out, it was because the steam generator wasn't operating properly. I had set the hot plate to 300 Celsius, which should be more than enough to boil water, but that's not really how hot plates work. 300 Celsius means the temperature the hot plate will reach if nothing is on top of it. A flask of water on top prevents the temperature of the plate from going much above 100 Celsius until all the water is boiled off. In that case, and for this hot plate, 300 just means medium heat. Because the heat wasn't enough, some of the water was actually condensing on the side of the flask and not exiting the steam generator. The apparatus was definitely producing some steam though, so I hadn't really worried much. I decided to run the same recipe of 40 minutes at 1000 degrees Celsius, but this time I changed the setting on the hot plate from 250 Celsius to 300 Celsius, 400 Celsius, and 500 Celsius. Here are the results. It's clear here that the setting on the hot plate is very relevant. Here's my best guess on oxide thicknesses. 
As you can see, 250C is wildly insufficient, and we only reach our expected oxide thickness at about 500C. Going forward, I'm going to use higher temperatures to ensure enough steam is produced, and I'm also going to better insulate the steam generator so water doesn't condense onto the sides of the flask like before. But the lesson here is that it's important to test your steam generator like this to ensure consistent results. Now, assuming I've solved all of my problems, I should be able to put a wafer in the furnace and see results that are both consistent and also match the expected values from the formula. Let's give it a shot. I'm going to do three separate tests. One wafer will be at 900C for 35 minutes. This should produce a brown oxide around 85 nanometers. The second test will be 1000C for 30 minutes, which should produce a 240 nanometer yellow gold oxide. The last one will be 1100C for 45 minutes, which should produce a 540 nanometer bright green oxide. I'm doing only one of each, and I'm accepting whatever results I get. I made sure this time to crank the heater and to insulate the Erlenmeyer flask with some aluminum foil. All right, first up, 900 Celsius, 35 minutes. This one looks all right. You can see that it's brown, but it's starting to change color, so I probably overshot by 5, 10 nanometers at most. I'm going to give this one a B plus. Next we have 1000 Celsius at 30 minutes. This one is a little bit more problematic. It's supposed to be gold, about 240 nanometers, but it's clearly closer to maybe 280, 290, so we overshot a fair bit. This may seem like a big error, but it actually only corresponds to a 20 degree temperature difference. I suspect I got a bit sloppy with the thermocouple placement. This one gets a C minus. And finally, 1100 Celsius, 45 minutes. Now that's what I'm talking about. That one is spot on, maybe at most 10 nanometers over. This one gets a well-deserved A plus. Wow, I really got carried away this time. I think it's safe to say that silicon oxidation is good to go. This is one of the four fundamental processes in semiconductor fabrication, and I'm super excited to use it to start creating devices in the near future. I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who watched this video. I never expected so many people would be interested in such a niche topic. And especially big thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon. Your support makes videos like this possible. I can't wait to show you what I've been working on next. See you next time.